Okay. So thank you for joining Calvert Library and the Calvert County Commission for Women as we discuss Financial Literacy 101. This event is being recorded, like I just said. Um, and uh, one more house, housekeeping tip. Um, you can put your questions in the chat um, and the uh, presenters yeah. will reply at the end. Um, I did add a couple of links to the chat um, for an upcoming program and a list of estate planning books that are available at the library. So thank you. Thank you guys. On the behalf of the County County Commission Women, we would like to take the time to thank each and every one of you for taking this time to attend our event, Financial Literacy 101. Today, our County County, our County Commission for Women seeks to provide the best rep rep I'm sorry, representation for women and girls. And we are pleased to be partnering with Calvert County Library to present this event in an effort to help each and every one of us to become more financially savvy and to become more aware of retirements, investments, and other items that will help us in our future and to give us a better understanding today. Today, we're presenting Sierra Mitchell, who is an attorney with Ming Law. She will be going over the following criteria, estate planning, estate administration, and directives. Also, we have Nate, sorry, Nav. I'm sorry, Nate, if I, Miss Navanta, correct me. Navatni. Navati with Edward Jones, investment, and he will be going over retirement plans. Sierra. Hey. So welcome everyone. So I um I'm also a member of the Commission for Women. Um, I'm an attorney in Prince Frederick. I've been with Meng Law for about 10 years now. And I do estate planning, but I also do family law, guardianship work, uh, real estate uh, law, and um, some other things related to working around Southern Maryland in the law. Um, I, what the Commission for Women wanted to put on this event because we know that there is a Am I muted? Mm -hmm. Was I muted? I'm just sorry. briefly, it looked like. I don't know what happened there. But the, the, um, <laughs> I had a pop up, so that's what that happened. So, um, what I'm going to present today is about estate planning, but not, um, and kind of give you an overview of what is included in an estate planning meeting when someone comes to meet with me. Uh, what documents do we talk about? So, most people call my office because they think they need to get a will done. Um, but there's other things that I think sometimes are more important. Uh, and those documents that I'm going to talk about are not just the will. So the will is what happens when someone dies. So how do you want your assets to pass when you have died? Um, sometimes people misconstru misconstrue this. They call it a living will. This is not a living will. A last will and testament is what happens when you've passed away. A living will is something I'm going to talk about later that comes in with an advanced directive about your medical care. Um, the other thing that we talk about in an estate planning meeting is a, an advanced directive. So that is choosing an agent essentially for who, who you want to help with your medical care and what you want to have happen at your end of life. Um, so that comes into play. You're still alive though, right? So this is who's going to help you. And then a power of attorney is the other document that we talk about in an estate planning meeting. And the power of attorney I'll get to later in more detail, but has to do with giving someone legal authority to act on your behalf. Okay, so those are the big three documents. So in order to understand some of the things I talk about today, I wanna to give you a couple terms that you need to understand. You've probably heard these words, but maybe didn't really understand the differences between them. One of those things is related to uh, what happens when you pass away. We've all heard that we have heirs, right? What is an heir? So an heir is a family member who inherits from your estate under the laws of intestacy. That means you don't have a will. If you die intestate, you do not have a will and your heirs would inherit. Your heir could be a parent. It could be a child. It could be a sibling. It depends 
on what your situation is at the time of death. Your descendants are people lower than you in the chart of a family tree. So it'd be my children or my grandchildren. I don't have any yet, but I'm sure some of you do. Um, and then, so that's a descendant. Uh, that's a term commonly used in a will uh, to, to signify what you want to have happen after you've died. A legatee is also a term that we use, and I might say that word today, so I want you to understand what that means. A legatee is someone that is named in a will. It might not be a family member whatsoever. It could be a friend that you wanted to leave something to, but we call them a legatee. It's, it's the, the term of someone that's going to receive something from a will. A, a term that's commonly um, used outside of Maryland is the term of an executor. In Maryland, the word for executor is called the personal representative. So a personal representative is who is going to be the person appointed to administer your estate. And I'll explain more in a little bit about what actually an estate is, but the personal representative is, the, is when you do your will, a person you're gonna choose to help do that process. And it's, it's a, quite honestly, it's a job that they have, they might have a lot of work to do. So it's, it, Commonly term, used term as an executor, but this is going to be, I might refer as the personal representative. Another term that comes up in advanced directives and powers of attorney, also in a will uh, possibly is a guardian. So you're, a guardian is someone that cares for another or is making decisions for another or managing property for another. So that's something for when we either have children alive or your person's alive, but maybe they're in incapacitated for some reason, a guardian could be appointed. A trustee is a fiduciary. That means uh, that someone that has been named to hold assets or to manage assets. Uh, I know everyone's heard of a trust. In a trust, there's always a trustee. Uh, Will might name a trustee. Um, there could be a trustee appointed in many terms of the law, but for this, we're thinking of um, someone that's going to be managing assets and holding them for you. And then I already went over the terms of agent and fiduciary. Oops, I apologize. I went back too far. Okay. So when someone comes to have an estate planning meeting with me, there are certain things that they're going to need to share so that you can get proper estate planning uh, advice, right? So most lawyers, if you went to meet with one, would give you an intake form that has lots of questions on it and will you know, collect a lot of information. But the things that I need to know might seem like to you odd that I need to know about this. A lot of people, when they fill out my intake form, think, I don't know why you need to know this. I just, I know who I want to leave what to. But estate planning encompasses more than just who you want to leave your things to. Um, it might have other aspects that I'll get into later that are, are considerations of other tools we can use to estate plan. So I want to know what your marital status is. Are you single? Are you a widow? Are you divorced? Have you had children from different marriages and have an, have an ex-husband? Um, I need to know if you've adopted children um, or if you have a child that perhaps sometimes people will come in and they'll say, I have these kids. But there actually is another kid, and they'll later, as we go through a meeting, explain that that child's estranged from them. It's important for me to know all of your children adopted or birthed from you that are biological children, because when I do an estate plan, I the way it's drafted is we're going to say, these are my children. Even if a child that you don't want to leave anything to is included in those children, I want to say their name and I will state their name in the will and say that it's not an oversight that you're not leaving them out of your will. And that's why when people do wills, it's good to do them with lawyers if they're going to do anything out of the ordinary in their estate plan, because we can have the foresight to know what could cause a problem in litigation after you die. If someone said they don't agree with the will. So that's why I need to know all the children. So another important thing is your net worth. And I don't mean that I need to know exactly down to the dollar what your net worth is. Um, but in general, it's a good idea for me to have a, at least in the range of a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and the only reason I really need to know this is one, to know what kind of assets you might have different places, but so that I know if you would have any sort of an estate tax issue. And I can tell you for the most part, no one that comes into my office has an estate tax issue. 
Uh, I'll get into that a little later as a common misconception, but people that have under $10 million are not going to have an estate tax issue. Um, only the top 1% one, 1 have estate tax issues in, in our country for the most part, and in Maryland, because we follow the federal estate tax exemptions in Maryland. So I also want to know about what, what do you own? So do you own real estate? Is your real estate in Maryland? Is it in another state? Um, how many pieces of property do you own? Uh, and have a list of those addresses of the properties that you have. Um, do you have bank accounts? What kind of bank accounts do you have or an, or an investment account? If you have an investment account, um, does it have a pay on death beneficiary? Does it have someone to transfer to it on death? Um, and, and how are these things titled? So is the real estate that you own titled jointly with your spouse? Do you own real estate with another family member? It's important because, I'll get into this in a few minutes, but um, when you die, how things are titled will matter as to what will pass through your estate. So I need to know what you own, if it has title to it, like a home or a house, I mean, a home or a, even a boat, a motorcycle, a trailer, things that have title, we need to know who it's titled with or if it's solely and what kind of title. Is it a title that has survivorship where if you die, it would become theirs immediately or does it have a uh, like a joint ownership called tenants in common? Um, I also like to know about any other sort of debts or financial concerns that someone might have because it could be possible that maybe we, we look at it that from a drafting perspective to maybe protect your assets. Um, so that's something that's important. And I don't need to know your credit card debt. I, it's more of knowing um, if there's any liens or judgments against you, that sort of thing. Um, if there's anyone either that might receive something that has a special need, this could be a disabled uh, adult child. This could be um, a, fa a family member you wanted to leave something to, but they receive government benefits. It's important that we know because we have some estate planning tools that can help still allow them to receive assets without making it so that they're disqualified from government benefits. Um, it's also important to know if you have a long-term care plan for, for long-term care insurance, or if it's possible at some point in your life, you might have to go on Medicaid. Medicaid, I, I, this, that would be a whole other financial literacy 101 event, but Medicaid is what ha, uh, a lot of elderly people, when they get to the point in life that they may need to go into a nursing home and they don't have enough monthly income to pay the nursing home bill, tend to have to go on to Medicaid, which will then pay the difference in that cost of what their income is and the monthly cost of a nursing home, which, you know, your income is only $3,000, a nursing home might cost $7,000 a month. Medicaid pays for that difference. But there's many planning tools that we can use, um, whether that's myself that does just estate planning, or I could send you to a Medicaid planning attorney to actually try to protect your assets if that might be a situation that you think could happen to you. Um, I also want to know if there is discord within your family members that may receive something. Uh, if your children aren't getting along and you're going to treat them differently, it's good for me to get an explanation in my notes so that I know um, maybe how to write your will differently, maybe so that it's possible there could be litigation based upon your will. And my file, if there were litigation based upon your will, would become part of the evidence, the record. So I make notes as to why you're making decisions because of possible family issues. And that could be uh, a family member you've already loaned a bunch of money to, you don't wanna, you wanna leave them out. It could be this child or person has a issue with substance abuse. And so um, you are concerned about how they might use the money. Um, so that you wanted to plan around them receiving it. Um, I also want to know about the, my client when they come in, what is their mental capacity? And I don't mean how smart they are. I mean, are they having any issues with dementia or Alzheimer's or memory um, or not understanding what they're possibly signing? When you come in to sign these documents, they're legal documents. So they're, your will, have, you have to have the legal capacity to sign a will, and you're going to have two witnesses that witness you doing this. Um, I, I get concerned uh, commonly if a child, a great example would be 
um, a 90 year old parent is it wants to do some estate planning. Their daughter that's in her, you know, her 60s calls me to schedule this appointment for mom. Says mom needs to do her will. And then that daughter brings mom in. I want to make sure that when I meet with mom, that what mom's telling me, one, she understands what she wants, but she's the one that is making these decisions and she's not being pressured by the daughter that brought her in. Um, I will oftentimes in those scenarios ask the child to leave the office, not necessarily my whole office space, but my meeting room so that I can have the opportunity to talk with mom I'm, or grandma alone to make sure that there's no pressure on her. I ask her questions to make sure she, on the day of signing, to make sure she understands what day it is, what year it is, who the president is, if I have any concern about the mental capacity of somebody. Um, and this is because we don't want I don't as an attorney, nor should anyone be wanting to have someone sign something they don't understand or they don't actually want or agree to. Uh, so, so I will take notes on that. Um, also, what kind of questions I've asked these people. So those are, I mean, there's other things to know when I have an estate planning meeting that are more case specific, but these are things that you could expect when you go to meet with somebody uh, as to, um, you know, don't get offended if you brought a parent in that the attorney asked you to step out of the room. Um, don't get defensive if they ask you about if you have any debts or what your assets are. There's just some, there are reasons behind it that might not seem obvious to the client, but it's, uh, it, there are reasons we're doing this. I'm not being nosy. I want to know. And it's also good um, on these kind of intake forms, whether, you know, what my office does one, but other law firms may do them the same way. What, um, writing down somewhere answers to some of these things, like the list of where your assets are. If you have a safety deposit box, that's important to list somewhere so that kids know where the key is. I also want to know if you've ever done a will before. And if you have ever done a will before, where it is. Uh, one thing that we do when we do wills is we, um, we actually will file them for safekeeping at the Register of Wills office, your original will that gets signed gets put into a sealed envelope that then um, has your identifying information on it. There's a $5 filing fee and you can do this in any county in Maryland, wherever your residence is, you'd wanna put it in, in the Register of Wills there. And that stays sealed. They don't look at it to make sure it's good or that it's valid. No one looks at it at all um, unless they come in with a death certificate because you've died. Um, or you can get it back out yourself if you want to make changes. But it is a place, a lot of people ask me when they come in and meet with me, where should I keep my will? <laughs> if you don't have a safe at home or you'd rather just make sure there's no possible way someone could get a hold of it to destroy it and that it'd be kept safe, that $5 filing fee, it gets delivered to the Register of Wills office and it, you know it's there and it's going to be protected. So that's a good option for people. Um, so I'm going to go through just specifically the will now and then go through the other documents. So when someone comes in, we do a last will and testament. What does that encompass? So a last will and testament will provide how your estate is administered. So what, you know, it provides things like whether or not um, uh, there's a bond waived. It will say who you want to be your personal representative. And it will, it'll help um, your personal representative. It gives them a guide on how you want probate assets to be distributed upon your death, okay? So there's lots of different ways um, that you can make these directions. Um, and the will is what I would call, it's like an instruction manual for your personal representative. It's an instruction manual for your family members as to what your wishes were not just with who gets what, but um, it, it goes into lots of other things. For instance, it directs for taxes to be paid and expenses to be paid. It can direct, um, you know, uh, who, like I said, the personal representative, who you want to manage your estate, but also an alternate. You wanna name someone besides, for instance, if you name your spouse as your personal representative and you died in an accident with your spouse, you want an alternate person that, you trust that's responsible to be able to take care of things in the event that your spouse has predeceased you or whoever you named first. Um, so that if that person died, 
in some similar time of you dying with your will, you don't have to go do a new will, you already have an alternate listed. So having at least one alternate personal representative is always advised. So a will can also name who you want to uh, be the guardian if you have minor children. So remember earlier, I explained what a guardian is. So this can be one person, it could be two people, it could be a couple. You can name an alternate if you don't, if it's possible that the first person you choose doesn't want to do it. But what is always important and I advise is that if you do have minor children and you write in, a, you do a will and say who you want to be the guardian, uh, that you have a conversation with those people uh, before you just put them down because it's a huge undertaking that they will be accepting if they accept to do it of raising your kids for you. Um, if you have minor children, your will can also create a trust for your children. In Maryland, children that are under the age of 18 cannot receive an inheritance or receive property outright. So even if you said to each of my kids $50,000, they can't receive that money directly until they're 18. So either your will will have a trust created in it and it can say at what age you want the children to receive it uh, and who would manage their money in that period of time. Or um, even if you didn't have this, then that guardianship proceeding has to take place. Someone has to be named to manage your children's money until they're 18. So doing a will allows you to have some control over who you, who you want to do this um, and at what age you think it's appropriate. Because 18, quite honestly, isn't always an appropriate age for children to receive large inheritances. Um, most people I work with don't choose 18 when I create a, what we call a testamentary trust for a minor. They usually choose an older age, like 22 after college is, is concluded, 25. Um, an important thing to know is uh, it doesn't mean that the kids couldn't have access to use the money if it's needed for something. Their guardian and their trustee would be able to take money out to use for their education, their benefit, for uh, their healthcare needs, things that are important, but there's oversight as to what is allowed. The kid doesn't just get to go buy a Mustang when they turn 16, right, or 18. Um, the, the money has some oversight by a responsible individual that you choose. So um, the, the most important thing though, what people come to me to do a will for is to say who they want to receive what. So what encompasses a, that, those assets is, is a very particular thing because your will only directs what goes into your probate estate. And your probate estate is only comprised of items that you own in your sole name. There's no joint beneficiary to it. There's no pay on death beneficiary and there's no joint title. So an example, when you die and you're married and you own a home, 99% of the time you own that home together as tenants by the entirety your home does not become part of your probate estate because your spouse owns it the second you die. If you have an account that's in your sole name, for instance, though, like a checking account, um, maybe you and your spouse have, have accounts on your own so you can spend money how you want um, without them seeing it. If you have that account, it's only in your name, that would be part of your probate estate. So, that matters when we do a will so that you understand that. Um, and that's also why it's important, like I said earlier, how I know things are titled. So what, when someone passes away, there's a process called probate. And I'm gonna go over that now because it's hard to explain a will without understanding what the probate process is. And I'm sure some of you have dealt with this with family members, maybe parents that have died. Um, but when you're choosing who's going to be your personal representative, it's important that you know what it entails, what their duties are, because it's a lot of work. And um, you wanna make sure that you're choosing someone that's organized and responsible that can get these things done, these paperwork items. Um, so, so we want to then, um, when someone, I'm gonna just give you guys a scenario. So, so let's say uh, dad has passed away. And what happens when someone passes away? We get a death certificate. Um, so what has to happen is we would take that death certificate 
to the Registrar of Wills office in the county where the residence was of that, the person was domiciled. So say it was here in Calvert County. And we go to open the estate with the death certificate and some documents called a petition for probate. That's where the personal representative asks to be appointed to this job as being the personal representative. Um, and then there's a number of documents that have to be um, provided after that point in time. Uh, if you're approved as the personal representative, um, the, the Registrar of Wills office will go into the safe, they'll get the will out and they'll open the will. They'll look at it to make sure that that's what the will stated that it said it's this person. Um, and then they would uh, administer the will, probate the will. It would be, it would be entered for probate. Um, a notice to creditors goes out in the mail from the Registrar of Wills office. Um, there's, it's published, it's published to the community that you are, you've been named as the personal representative. And then you get a document called letters of administration. This is like the license for you to act as though you are your parent to get things done to wrap up their estate. So that letter of administration is very important. And if someone you know dies and you're trying to do anything legal, that is what's going to need to be provided. For instance, to sell the house, to transfer the title with the deed, they'll want to see that. Uh, life insurance policies want to see them sometimes. So this letter of administration is something you might hear frequently if you have a loved one that dies and you're helping with their estate. You have to get a tax ID number for an estate. Just like we have social security numbers, a tax ID number for a, an estate is like a, a tax ID number for a business. Um, because an estate when your parent dies, that estate, their tax ID number, um, I'm sorry, their social security number isn't used any longer if there's income. They, you would do their final tax returns with their social security number. You file their income tax returns for that prior year. Um, but moving forward, estates can have income. Um, estates can have losses. So if some property is sold and there is a gain on the property, so at the let's say we we value the, the, your dad's house at $300,000 at the time of his death, but we sell it six months later and we had a market boom like we had in the last two years, it might be worth $80,000 more at the time of sale. That $80,000 actually is taxed as income to the estate. So you have to do what's called a fiduciary tax return. So that's why we have a tax ID number. You also need that tax ID number because you have to open a bank account. And you can't open a bank account without a social security number or a tax ID number. So the personal representative would open an, what's called an estate bank account. Uh, it's usually a checking account. And they're gonna do everything by check, old way, paper. We want paper trail for everything when you're doing an estate. So after those initial things are taken care of, we have paperwork that has to take place from the lawyer's perspective, but from the personal representative's perspective, they have things they have to do. They need to, uh, they need to gather everything this person owned. That would be, you know, ensure that the things in their home are, are taken care of and protected. We have to have them appraised. So we have the home appraised sometimes. We have the household items, like I'm not saying like kitchenware, but nice furniture, tech, tech things, uh, TVs. We have an appraiser come through and go through the home and we do an inventory of what their personal property items are, but also, and that would include vehicles, like getting the Kelly Blue Book value for vehicles. It also includes um, finding the data death balances for your, the bank accounts that this person may have had or investment accounts, mutual funds accounts, um, things that Nate will be talking about later. Um, and then we do that initial inventory to get a baseline of what the estate is worth. Um, then you know, for a while, my job's kind of done with helping a, a personal representative, but they have to sell assets so that they can create cash to give to the family members. Um, or they may list the house for sale. It depends on what the will says, really. Um, they would have the ability to then pay for expenses of the property, the mortgage, if there's a mortgage that got to pay the electric bill, we don't want pipes to freeze, that sort of thing. But their job is to protect that to sell assets, assets as needed to create liquid funds and then um, pay any claims of creditors. So this is something important for people to know. After the, when someone has passed away, there are six months from the date of death for a creditor to file a claim on an estate. If you are ever the personal representative of an estate and a creditor files a claim 
at six months and one day from the date of death, you don't have to pay it. It's not required. It, it, you know, it, you can if you want to, but you don't have to. So, but they do have to pay claims possibly if they were filed under six months. Um, so that would be a job of the personal representative, depending on what assets are available. Um, oftentimes a good uh, practice note is that if, for instance, you have credit card claims that get filed, most of the time those credit card companies will allow you to negotiate down what's due. If you just call them and say, hey, I'll give you $3,000 on this $5,000 claim and I'll pay you right now, they almost always negotiate down. So it's worth a try. The worst thing they'll do is say no, just a little just a little practice pointer, okay? Um, and then after nine months from the date of death, an accounting is due. And that can most typically should be the first and final accounting. And that will look at everything that the state owned, everything that came in as income, expenses that were paid, and then we get a <laughs> final number at the bottom, which is called the residue. And your will directs what happens with the, the distribution then. So if if it said to my three children at equal shares, your accounting will say 33% of this person in the cash amount, you know, the estate's worth $600,000, $200,000 to this child, $200,000 to this child, $100,000 to this child. So that's the final accounting. Um, another important thing to know when you choose a personal representative, your personal representative has a right to take a commission from the value of your estate. The commission, it can the, the the total commission is not supposed to be worth more than it's complicated nine percent of the first twenty thousand dollars of the estate and then 3.6 of the remainder so if we do a calculation at the end of what they're actually have a right to receive but um you know you might know that one person may not would waive that commission they have a right to waive it they don't have to accept it some per person that you choose, you might think that you want them to be able to have the commission because it is a lot of work depending on what you own at the time you die. So it's just something to be aware of that whoever you choose, if it's not someone who's receiving from the estate, they may be getting a portion of what your estate is by doing that. And that's also how an attorney gets paid. When you hire an attorney to help you with the estate, they get paid out of that commission instead of the personal representative. So that, it, that goes in that accounting at the last step. And then fiduciary tax returns might need to be paid or in filed, like I mentioned, if there is a gain on anything that was coming to the estate or if there's a loss. If there was a significant loss on the estate as an item sold for much less than what they were valued, then that loss can be passed on to the legatees of the will or the beneficiaries of the estate. So you, if you got, that would be equally if there was a $20,000 loss, each person would get 33% for their, when they do their income taxes the next year to claim as a loss on their own taxes. So it is good to do tax returns if there's either a really large loss on the estate or in general, you have to do them if there's a gain, okay? And then you just distribute the proceeds. So I think I've gone over this and just talking through, um, but what should be included in my will? Um, of course, we want to name the personal representative. We want to uh, say who receives what. So what legatee would receive what. If you have minor children, you want to name a guardian and a trustee for their trust if there's going to possibly be a minor that receives money. And that might not just be a minor that's your child that might receive money. It could be a grandchild that's a minor because you have a deceased child. A grandchild can't receive the money outright either. So we want to have that provision about the testamentary trust that that money would be managed by someone. Um, and then at what age you would want any minor that receives from you to, um, to take the funds. So a lot of people probably are wondering, or they come to me and say, well, so what's a typical will distribution? And what is typical will, of course, depend on what your, your marital situation is. But um, a typical distribution, if you're married and you have children, would say everything to my spouse first. And if my spouse has predeceased me, to my children in equal shares. Um, a couple things, and, and you don't have to do that. I have a very large number of parents that come to do wills with me that have adult children that disinherit a child. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in common misconceptions later, but they'll take someone out and, or leave them something different. It doesn't have to be equal. Um, it could be different percentages that you sent, you give them. Um, 
you can really do whatever you want as long as it's legal and, uh, and we draft properly for it. Um, the more strange of a disposition you write out, the more complicated it gets and the more likely that there'll be a problem with your will. So for the most part, that's why it's good if you have some unusual circumstance to talk to an attorney about it. Um, so some things that I don't want people to forget when they draft a will. Um, if they have a child that's predeceased them and that child might have children, I think it's a good idea for them to think about if those grandchildren should receive something since their parent has predeceased them. And, you know, you don't have to give them anything. It's just something that sometimes I've noticed they'll forget. And then I bring it up and like, oh yeah, I guess, you know, maybe we should give them, you know, Johnny share since Johnny would have received it himself. So that's just something to consider. Um, and also think about who is that best person to name as the personal representative. Um, usually it is your spouse first, but who else do you know that's, you know, what it might be, you have a couple children, but some of them, you know, aren't very good with money or they're not very organized or they don't live nearby and they're not going to be the best people that will take care of this promptly or be the most trustworthy. You also can't name a personal representative that's been charged with any uh, serious criminal violations, um, which would imp like it can makes the register of wills concerned about their their reputation, their honesty and their ability to manage money and have money because they're going to they, it's possible they have a lot of money. Um, and that's why uh, when we open an estate, there is a bond because if a, a bond is like an insurance policy. So a bond will protect the estate from any sort of um, theft by the personal representative, okay? Um, you also wanna think about those specific bequests. A lot of people come in and they have like women, it's a great example, mm -hmm. older women that have jewelry. And they want so and so. I want my my daughter to have my. Don't work. And I want um, uh, you know my certain certain specific item to go to this certain specific person. Um, I I actually for the most part, unless there's just a few specific things, I try to talk people out of making long lists that go into a will of items uh, like a this gun this. Um, piece of jewelry, this painting, this piece of furniture. And I suggest to them if they're already, you know, getting up in years and they don't have, they don't think they have a lot of time left to enjoy it. Why don't you give it to them now? It, it creates less of a complicated scenario at death if the person's already received it. Um, and you get the opportunity to already enjoy seeing them receive it and that, you know, gift giving pleasure. Um, but Putting a lot of specific items in a will is complicated. And if at the time you die, for instance, no one can find that sapphire ring, then that person that was supposed to receive it has a problem and it causes a lot of discord between the family members. It may, it, it just creates legal issues. So usually what I do instead, is the one thing is to ask them to just gift it to them in advance. Or sometimes I will say, do you trust your personal representative enough that if you just made a list and said, I'd like them to receive these things. I understand it doesn't create a legal obligation, but I made a list of these, you know, because I know my niece would really like this, or I know, you know, so and so would really like this. I made this list. I put a provision in the will that says I asked my personal representative to do this, but I know that it doesn't require them to. And it doesn't name anything, it just refers to a list that I have set out somewhere specific. Okay. Um, if you name a bunch of things in your will to go to specific people, we have to have them appraised. And, and it could get really tedious and it could require, if you're giving to nieces and nephews or friends, taxes to be paid on inheritance for those items. So it's better to give them an advance or to give them on the side and ask your personal representative to just follow your wishes. Um, another really important consideration when you do a will is what, um, if you want to leave money to different people, it typically doesn't go so well if you say, I want dollar amounts to go to specific people, unless it's like under $10,000 and you know you have $300,000 um, because this can go wrong. It's If at some point at you become incapacitated, the nursing home is you spent a lot of your money you had to sell your house, you don't have this money left and you put down 10,000 to each of these five people, that could be your whole estate. 
And then your, you know, the other people that you leave the residue to may have nothing left to receive because the dollar amounts go first if they're specific dollar amounts. If grandparents want to say like 2000 to each grandchild, I'm usually fine with things like that. But for the most part, I suggest percentages because percentages will be equal no matter where you are at the million dollars or $200,000. They'll still stay the same. Okay. So that's something to consider too. That's important because we, I've seen it go wrong, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, another thing I mentioned this for a moment, but inheritance taxes. So when, uh, when you die and you leave items to people like your children or your parents or your siblings or your grandchildren, direct lineal descendants do not pay inheritance taxes, but nieces and nephews do, friends do. Yes, Jewish um, baby, and I love you, but I gotta, I gotta go. So, nieces and <laughs> I gotta go because you're the best. You are um, the best of their wealth. You are the best. I, I have to put you in here, and then not as comfy, not as cozy, not as Sorry. warm. Can, Jen, can you mute that? I can't do it. Um, so, inheritance taxes are ten percent to nieces and nephews, for example. Um, so. And your estate may pay that out of the estate or it could be paid directly by the person receiving the item. If it's an item though, and it doesn't have a cash value to it, we then have to pull cash out of the estate to pay it. So just consider that. And if you're gonna give anything to nieces and nephews, that's one reason I suggest to give it to them before you die. Um, okay, so one thing I think is important to go over is like common misconceptions that people have when they come in to meet with me. Um, because for this kind of an event, like financial literacy 101, doing estate planning, I think um, people will have these kind of questions. This, this is a basic level sort of event. Um, one thing that people commonly think that's wrong is that um, when it, they, they have concerns, so they want to leave things to their kids, but adult kids, but their kids married to some guy they don't like, right? So we're worried that if I leave this to my child, their spouse is also going to get it too. Well, it's not exactly true. For one, their spouse doesn't have to receive anything. That would be up to your child how they want to title what they receive. Let's say they receive $100,000 cash from the estate. If you're concerned about this and maybe you have an open relationship with your child to discuss this, what I say is tell them to never commingle that $100,000 in an account with their spouse. They don't have to share it at all. I'm a divorce attorney as well. So I'm very aware of this. If you inherit money, it is not marital property if you don't commingle it, okay? So tell them if, you know, something happens and they're concerned or they're on the, you know, on the outs or they've had issues in their marriage to put that money directly from that estate check into a account in their sole name. And they can put a pay on death on it to somebody else that's not their spouse. It is not marital. They would not be able, the spouse wouldn't be able to get it if they get divorced. But that's your child's job to do this properly, okay? Another really common misconception um, that causes big problems down the road is that uh, a scenario where, uh, you know, your dad dies and he did a will. And in the will he wrote, uh, I leave the family farm in Burms Island to my daughter, Becky. Well, Becky thinks, because she's already living there, that she doesn't have to do anything. And she never opens an estate. And really the only thing that dad owned was the farm. And she just continues carrying on. She'll pay the real property taxes under dad's name. And they never retitle the property. If you receive something, even though it's through a will, you still have to open an estate. And you need to get the letters of administration and you need to transfer the property to yourself if you're the personal representative or to who, you know, or to whoever is the person receiving it if you're the personal representative. You have to change the title and you cannot change the title on real estate unless you open an estate. Sometimes people wait years to do this. I mean, 80 years. And then we realize someone in the family wants to sell the property or they then built houses on the property and they can't sell it. They can't subdivide it. We have to go open an estate from someone who died years ago and contact every single person who could have been an heir or a descendant along the line. It is a big costly situation to fix. So if you inherit a piece of property, you need to open an estate. 
okay? Um, that doesn't mean you were jointly titled on it. If you're jointly titled, that's totally different if it's you receive that outright at death and you can retitle it if you want to, you really should change it just into your soul name. Um, so another common mis or question, I wouldn't know if this is a misconception is, can you disinherit your spouse? Um, so someone could come in with me and do a will and their will could say that I, they're married to this person. Maybe it's a later in life marriage, we, you know, a golden marriage. And they leave everything to their children in their will. And they say that they're going to not leave anything to their spouse. They can draft a will that says that. Yes. But their spouse, if their spouse outlives them, they can file to request to take a statutory share. So in general, you can try to disinherit your spouse, but it doesn't always work. They might contest it and say, no, I want my share. And their share is one half if there's no children or one third if there are surviving children, okay? So you can try to do it. You can do it by agreement. Maybe you both have a prenuptial agreement that says that you can do this. That's appropriate. Um, but you, you can't entirely wipe them out if they're not willing to lay down and take it, <laughs> okay? Um, and then uh, can you disinherit your children? I've mentioned this already. Absolutely. You can disinherit your children. You don't have to leave anything to any of them. You could just skip them and give everything to charity. You could skip them and go right to the grandchildren and leave the money in a testamentary trust or do something else. But yes, you do not have to give equal shares to your kids. You do not have to give them anything at all. Um, you can leave everything to your new spouse and give the kids nothing. Um, so it's totally up to you. You get the control if you do your will. If you die without a will is totally different though. So um, the other misconception is that I don't need a will because if I die, I'll just, my spouse will get everything. If you have everything you own jointly titled with your spouse, yes, they will get everything. But there's usually items that are forgotten, they're missed. That checking account that you had before you got married that you still put money in or a savings account your vehicle, or maybe one of the vehicles you have, because you have many, your, you know, the husband bought a boat and a motorcycle, and those are titled jointly with his wife. Those are common things that get missed when a spouse dies in a marriage. And then we still have to do an estate. Um, so that's why even though um, you might have most things titled jointly, it's still good to do a will leaving everything to your spouse first, because if you, if your spouse dies, and there was a few things forgotten. Say there's an account that has $100,000 in it. You don't get all of it. You have to share it with your kids. Even though that might not have been what he meant to do, but that might be what happens. So um, when someone dies without a will, we call that that they've died in testate. And that means that um, there's no will to probate. So we follow these specific directions that are set out in statute in Maryland. And each state has it a little differently. But like I said, if you die um, with a spouse and children um, and your kids are minors, right? So right now, uh, let's say I have a $100,000 account. I never put my husband on. I didn't do a pay on death and I died right now. My husband would get half of it, but my minor kids would get half of it. And it'd have to go into a trust until they're 18. If I don't have a will, he doesn't get all of the $100,000. So um, it changes for different uh, scenarios. Like if the children are adults, it's a little different. Um, they don't split it 50, 50. Um, if you, the only real easy way is if to not need a will is if you're an adult that has kids and you're a widow perhaps, or you're single and you want all your kids to receive everything evenly, that's what will happen that your kids would get even shares equally, but you don't get, then your will wouldn't direct who you want to be the personal representative. So the kids may fight over that. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the different possible scenarios, but I think it's important just to know that they're out there and you could find out from your very specific situation. Um, a good resource is the, the Register of Wills office website. If you guys just Google Maryland Register of Wills, there's a lot of documents there. If you're looking for what your scenario is, if you died without a will, there's their pamphlets there for you to look up. Uh, one other common misconception, I want to touch this just briefly, and I'm probably going to go longer than I thought, but is that I need, I, people come in and they think they need a trust. And I can tell you for the most part, most people that come to me, 
I'd say 95%, 90 more, 97, do not need a trust. Um, in Maryland, like I said, it might sound a little complicated to you, but the probate process is not difficult. And so people come in, they think they need a trust because they wanna avoid taxes. Well, for the most part, unless they're giving, they have, like I said, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, they're not paying taxes if they're leaving things to their kids or their spouse or their siblings. So you don't need a trust to try to avoid taxes. Um, for the most part, um, Sometimes people think they need a trust because it's kind of like, oh, my friend has a trust, or I've heard that that's kind of feels like a established, successful thing to get, right? Um, it, I am an estate planning attorney and I don't have a trust because I don't think it's necessary. Um, a lot of lawyers, if someone comes to them and they say, I want to get a trust done, a lawyer sees dollar signs because trusts are more expensive to, to prepare. Uh, you're talking about a couple thousand dollars instead of like thousand to twelve hundred dollars for an estate plan. Um, and I try to avo avoid people creating a trust because a lot of times they don't properly work because the people that are named to be the trustee or they're the, the person that creates the trust, they don't manage them properly. So if you create a trust and you die, but not every single thing you own is in the trust, and that means titled to the trust, you have to redeed things, you have to title vehicles to the trust, you have to change bank accounts, everything has to go to the trust, then you still have to have a probate estate anyway. So it's kind of like you just threw all your money down the drain that you tried to create a trust for. So I do, for the most part, talk, try to talk people out of them. If they really want it, I'm happy to do it. Um, but most people, like I said, don't need them that live in Maryland. Certain states change that though, depending on their specific laws. Um, so if you move from this state, you might wanna consider um, talking to an attorney about if it'd be beneficial for you to have a trust. So um, one other, I'm just gonna do this. Uh, one common other misconception is that people often add a child on a bank account when they get older because it helps them with paying bills. Maybe they have like reached a point where it's hard for them to do math. Um, they just get a little confused. I'm not saying they're incapacitated, but that, you know, they need some help. So they'll sometimes will add one of their kids on a bank account that holds all of their assets, really everything they own. And they don't intend that that kid's going to keep all the money, but if they die and that's how it's titled jointly, that's what happens. And then there's nothing, I've seen it where there's nothing left to put through probate. There's no estate because by creating this joint account, one child got everything and they don't have to give it back. Um, people, it, people call it like a convenience account sometimes, but what the banks usually do is they don't do it properly. They don't put the person on as a power of attorney. They put them on jointly and that screws up, I'm sorry to say that word, <laughs> that messes up the intention of the actual person that, that, that we call the testator, um, because maybe they really wanted all three of their kids to get even amounts, but now it's ruined because this account goes directly to that person on death. And then one other thing I just want to explain, um, before, and then the advanced directive and the power of attorney will be pretty quick portions. The will is really the more complicated aspect, but um, what I mentioned that the cost for a trust, a cost for estate planning, if you want to think about, there are different ways different lawyers charge. So some lawyers will charge you just a flat fee and they'll do all these documents. I'm going to talk about the will, the power of attorney and the advance directive, and it's a flat rate. It might be a thousand dollars. I, it just depends one firm to the next, what they do and they think is appropriate, or if that's all the work they do, or if they do other types of law, it kind of changes. My office, for example, I don't charge a flat rate. I charge for my time by the hour. So that's also really common. You'll see different rates in this area in Southern Maryland. It'll be anywhere from $300 an hour to $450 an hour, depending on the experience of the attorney. And it matters because usually more experienced attorneys do this faster, so they spend less time creating your estate plan. Um, and they know to troubleshoot signs of where there could be a, something we need to draft better for or to suggest some other type of planning. Uh, so that's what you can expect for uh, cost. So that was all of the will. The power of attorney is one of the other documents in our big three documents that we do when we do a regular estate plan, not a trust. Um, so the power of attorney is, is what is a, your ability to say, I'm giving this person who is your agent, your, the ability to make financial decisions for you 
and the legal authority to make fin to make um, legal decisions, to sign documents for you, to access accounts, to pay bills, to file your taxes for you, because in, in the power of attorney is a little different than the next document I'm going to talk about, because the power of attorney comes into play when you endorse it, when you sign it. So you name this agent, this person, it's typically a spouse if you're married, you name them, but it might be a child or a different person um, that you have the utmost trust for. First of all, you don't want to name someone that has, is very trustworthy and is very organized and can manage money and understand complicated legal documents. So your power of attorney, um, they, if something happens to you, of course, they would step in and do this role, but they can do it even if nothing's happened to you. So when I have someone sign a power of attorney, I tell them now, understand, you may give this to your child that you're naming as your agent, but that will give your child the ability to go and go see your bank account that day, to go take it to the bank and be able to have access to those funds. It does not mean they get to have the money. They don't get to spend it for themselves. That would be actually a crime if they do that, or if they take it for anything but for your benefit. Um, it is, it is a criminal act in Maryland. Um, but uh, it, it just is important for the whoever's signing this document to know that it, it becomes effective immediately, okay? Um, so sometimes I don't always tell people to give it, oh, give it to a child right away. Just tell them where it is if they need to get it because something's happened to you. Or, you know, if you perfectly 100% trust them, go ahead and give it to them. You can already give it to the bank if you want, if you really trust this child and want the bank to be able to have, um, have them sign stuff for you now or go do your banking for you. Um, sometimes you might be going out of town and your POA is going to close on a piece of real estate for you. They can sign deeds for you. Uh, they can enter into contracts for you. So that's, that's what this document does. Um, so why do you need one? You need one if something is happening, if in case it becomes really, you need, well, sorry, strike that. If you need one because if you want someone to help you with things, right? Like I just said, or because something does happen to you and you can no longer access your account, you can no longer pay your bills. You can't, you don't have the ability to um, call social security and get set up getting social security for yourself. You, if, if you don't have a power of attorney, what happens is it becomes too late sometimes. You get in an accident and you have an injury and you can't sign a legal document anymore. You get older, you, your dementia has progressed or your Alzheimer's progressed to the point where you can't sign a legal document. If you don't have a power of attorney in advance, which is a very easy, cheap document to get, and I actually suggest this before you, more, this is more important to me than a will. Because if you don't have one, in order for someone in your family to be able to get access to those things, they have to file a circuit court lawsuit and request to have guardianship over you so that they can manage your funds. And that kind of a lawsuit requires usually that person hiring an attorney and then an attorney getting appointed for you that's disabled to make sure you're disabled and, and advocate for you. It, it can cost $2,000 to $10,000 for them to do this. It's extremely expensive and to get a power of attorney is not. So if you, even if you get just diagnosed with like early dementia, get a power of attorney. Um, the next document that's important, and, and I forgot to say this, but all that an attorney needs to know to do a power of attorney for you is who you want to name their address and their contact information and an alternate typically. So it's very simple. The rest of it is really just a boilerplate document that we have. Um, that was approved by the Attorney General's Office in Maryland. It's a statutory form. So it's very inexpensive to do this. Um, the next document that is important, say for the same reasons, is an advanced directive that if it's too late and you don't have someone to make these medical decisions for you, it you have to file a guardianship, which is a lawsuit in the circuit court. So the advanced directive makes decisions, uh, allow, or it, it's your ability to say who you want to be your agent to make medical decisions for you or to be able to speak to your doctors if you aren't able. It allows like them to be able to have access to your documents because there's a HIPAA waiver. It can provide special instructions for women that um, are in, like childbearing years still. You can get very specific instructions of what you'd want to have happen to you if you were pregnant and you were in a serious accident 
if you want to be kept alive or not, you can give these sort of specific instructions. Um, so naming who the agent is, their contact information, and your wishes. So then there's a section on the advanced directive that is your living will. Not a will and testament, last will and testament, a living will. This is where we've heard of, that's been in the news as to, you know, how do you, what do you want to have happen to you when you're at the end of your life? Do you want to be uh, kept on life support and fed by tubes and be on a ventilator? Or do you want to be able to die naturally in these three different scenarios uh, that this form provides? So the scenarios are a cancer scenario, like a terminal condition, a persistent vegetative state can, uh, scenario. Uh, years ago, I think it was in the 90s, we, had, we heard all over the news about Terry Schiavo. She did not have a living will and she didn't name an agent. So her parents and her spouse were fighting over whether to keep her on life support or not. This is your ability to direct what you want to have happen to you. And then it, it gives you the ability to say whether, you know, who's going to do these, do these things for you, who's going to make these decisions for you and not really make the decisions, but carry out your wishes. Um, and, uh, and then there's a, the second part of it is what happens after you've died. Um, we have a second part to our form that provides for, what are your wishes as far as organ donation? Um, is it that you would donate anything, only these specific items? Um, people that have different religious wishes may, are, may be comfortable with one thing, but not the other. And then it directs uh, your funeral arrangements. So who's going to take care of your funeral arrangements for you? And if you've never communicated specifically to your family what, um, what arrangements you want, this is a great place to do that. Could be as simple as saying, I'd like to be cremated. It could be as complicated as I want, you know, I've already had made arrangements with the Raymond Wood funeral home. I would like these certain songs played at my funeral and I have this burial plot here. So it can be very specific. It could, it could be, um, you don't have to do it at all, really. You can leave that section out, but it's just a, a very important place for you to write that down to communicate those wishes. So those are your um, big three documents, the will, the power of attorney, and the advanced directive. Um, but just for just some knowledge, there are some other things that an attorney might consider uh, in doing planning for you that aren't those documents. And so it would depend on your specific scenario. Um, but sometimes, like I said, we talked about the trusts. Um, and, and like I said, if you're concerned about estate taxes, Unless you have $12 million, you're not going to pay any estate taxes. Now, I guess they could change the law on this, right? But um, for right now, you're good. Um, and so if they change the law, you can get a trust later. But um, for right now, you're good. For a single person, it's $12 million. Even if you have $12 million, but you're married, for the double of you, the, the, the pair, it can be $24 million. So, uh, you know, and I quite honestly, if you have that much money, I'm sending you to a tax attorney. I'm not doing this for you. So, um, because you need some far more advanced planning than I uh, am, am going to be able to do. So other things we can do sometimes that are important to consider are retitling things like deeds, adding a family member to the deed. Um, that's a way that we look at planning, not just from a, who receives it, but to protect assets sometimes. Like I mentioned, um, if you might in the future need to go on Medicaid um, or you might have some really large debts that might happen for you, uh, then we might retitle your house to add your three kids or just one child or whoever you want to receive it in advance of, of your, your passing. So that's something we do. Sometimes, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of a life estate, but life estates are a vehicle, a, a planning tool we use sometimes where this is, um, this is where if I, I own a piece of property, I wanna keep being able to use it for the rest of my life, but I'm gonna give it to my kids now. I write them a deed to my children and I retain the rights of a life estate to use it for the rest of my life. That means that when I die, it goes directly to them. They can't sell it or do anything with it without my permission because I get the right to use it till I die. So that's a vehicle that we use, a, a, I say vehicle, an instrument that we use sometimes. Um, like I mentioned before, um, a really important thing for spouses to do if they want to avoid probate is to make sure they have pay on deaths on their accounts. Even if you don't have them as a joint holder on account, you can go to your bank and say, I want to add a, pay on, a POD, a pay on death or a transfer on death, and you sign a document, and then that takes care of that. You could change it later if you changed your mind or you got divorced or you did something, but that's a really good way of um, 
creating a, an estate plan that avoids probate when the first person dies. Or if you only have one child and you want to just give everything to them, right? You know, now you can add a pay on death and they won't have to do probate to get that, to get access to that account. Um, if you're getting married later in life, it's also important sometimes to consider a prenuptial or a postnuptial agreement. Prenup just means before you actually get married. Right. Postnup can be that you do it right after you get married, anytime after you get married. That might say that uh, you, your yeah. spouse later in life, you're not going to give them anything because you all are both established already. So you're not going to share at that point in time. Um, and your kids will receive what you are, you know, what you own. So that's something that consider the gifts, like I talked about, and also um, life insurance or other types of insurance, like long-term care planning insurance. So um, we're going to take questions at the end, if anyone has questions for me about what I've gone over, but that's in general, the, the same meeting planning stuff that I go over when I have a client come in that's interested in doing estate planning. Uh, so uh, you know, I hope you guys learned some stuff from me today and I'll take questions at the end after Nate is finished. Thank you. All right. That was a great presentation, Tierra. I, I found it interesting myself. Uh, good refresher for some stuff and uh, definitely picked up on a few things that uh, I didn't already know, so that was that was good. Um, so my name is Nate Novotny. Uh, again, I'm a financial advisor with Edward Jones and Prince Frederick, uh, right around the corner from Sierra on Cherry Lane. Um, so today, with uh, retirement planning, just want to talk about some uh, some basic uh, foundational stuff on 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 how you reach your retirement planning goals. Um, so three key steps. Uh, is number one, it's pretty basic, but sometimes it gets overlooked. It's just getting organized and creating a budget. Um, you know, it's critical, right? You, you got to know how much money you got coming in, how much money you got going out, um, and those types of things. Um, and then the next step is really developing a solid investment strategy, you know, starting with, you know, where you're at today, what your current situation is, where do you want to go? What are your goals? Um, you know, if it's a retirement goal or some other uh, savings goal that you're working towards. And if you're on track, uh, good. If you're not, what steps do we need to take to make those adjustments? And that's where that strategy really comes into play to uh, make sure that we're on track to achieve those, uh, those goals. And then lastly, preparing for the unexpected. Um, you know, so trying, you know, you can't prevent things. You can't uh, predict things uh, necessarily uh, what's going to happen in the future. So how can you prepare uh, for those unexpected events that might have the opportunity to derail your strategy. <clears throat> um, so again, on the you know the basic side of you know financial organization and budgeting, um, you know first you really need to understand what your necessary spending is versus your dis discretionary. So what do you need to spend? Like what are your you know your hard expenses like you know food things like that that you need shelter electricity those types of things. Um, versus, you know, discretionary, you know, going out to happy hour or vacations and those types of things, you know, I'm not saying don't have those expenses. That's what makes uh, life worth living, uh, doing those fun things, but really understanding what, you know, where you're spending your money and what's, what's needed and versus what's, you know, more of a want. Um, evaluating your debt is something that's really important to look at. Um, you know, there's all kinds of debt. You know, simply put, there's good and bad. Uh, an example of good debt, you know, might be your mortgage, you know, things that are tax deductible uh, on the interest you're paying. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, bad debt uh, would be that 28% credit card debt uh, that you have that you're, you know, uh, you're just getting ridiculous interest rates that they charge uh, for credit card debt. You know, that may be something you might want to be uh, looking at ways to eliminate those types of debts. Um, recurring expenses is one that always think is worth revisiting. Um, I think all this stuff you should do annually. Um, but, you know, one that always comes to mind is like the cable bill, right? You, you know, you start, you sign up with whoever your uh, cable provider is and, you know, it's 200 bucks a month. And then somehow or another, you know, 18 months down the road, it's $350. And like those types of things, or maybe subscriptions that you've signed up for, 
some of this little stuff that you just put on an automatic payment plan with your credit card or whatever, however you're paying for it. Um, you know, you may not even use those services uh, anymore, or, you know, usually what happens is over time, they, they become more expensive without you really noticing. Um, so that's just a good opportunity to take, take stock of those types of things and, and how you can, uh, you know, either eliminate them if you're not using them or potentially reduce those costs. Um, and then major, you know, big major monthly expenses, uh, thinking about like your mortgage and insurance for homeowners insurance and car insurance. Um, you know, mortgage rates uh, are top of mind for a lot of people. They've gone up, you know, recently, but still relatively uh, low from where they historically have been. Um, so it's a good time if you haven't refinanced um, to look at those options. Does it make sense? Uh, you know, it could be cost associated with it. So it may not, you know, for uh you know, a quarter of a percent reduction in your interest rate, maybe that's not worth the expense, but, um, and just shopping around for insurance, uh, you know, there's, if you, again, similar to some of these other expenses, if you've been with a company for a while, sometimes the rates will creep up on you without, uh, without you really knowing or understanding why. Um, and then making sure that you have the proper coverage as well is also, uh, you know, a good idea there. Uh, and then, you know, so once you've kind of got all these expenses, sorted out and you know where you're at, um, you know, you have to compare that with the money you've got coming in the door, right? Is there, you know, are you spending more than you're making, um, you know, or do you have a surplus, you know, and, and again, how can you create a bigger cushion uh, if you, you know, could eliminate or reduce some of these expenses uh, that you and your family has? And then lastly, um, something that I think people often overlook, it's certainly been in my experience when I talk to uh, newer clients that, uh, account and asset consolidation, you know, a lot of times, you know, people will leave a job and they left, you know, they left that job 10 years ago and they worked somewhere else for five years and then they left that place and they've got, you know, by the time they're in their forties, they may have four, you know, old retirement plans from all these businesses they worked for that are just still in the company's 401k plan. Nobody's, you know, managing them. Nobody's paying attention to them. They're just forgotten. Um, you know, or having, you know, even some people have have the idea that maybe having money at several different places is the equivalent of having more money. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously not, um, you know, and uh, so there's, you know, good opportunities there, consolidating some assets and accounts uh, gives you greater flexibility, uh, potentially on how you can manage those assets uh, to achieve your goals. Um, so that's, Kind of it on the budget and you know organization stuff. It's pretty basic, but I think, like I said, it, it's a good idea to uh, you know I myself we do it once a year. We we look at you know what our expenses are, what our you know what our income is, and and you know just it's a good idea just to revisit that periodically to make sure you're you know you're not missing any money somewhere or wasting any money somewhere. Um. So then, really jumping into. Uh, you know, the retirement planning side of things and what's the, the foundation of, of, of setting up uh, your strategy to reach your, you know, usually the number one goal for folks uh, financially is retirement, um, you know, and then there's some other goals, you know, beyond that, maybe it's a, you know, a, an additional piece of property or paying for school for your kids and those types of things. Um, but, you know, we're going to talk mostly about retirement, but some of these strategies apply to, you know, achieving any financial goal you might have. Uh, in terms of investing. So, you know, rule number one, uh, most important step here, you got to have a strategy. Um, and that strategy has got to be based on, you know, what's most important to you. What is your specific goal? It can't be, you know, just a general strategy. You know, it's not one size fits all. Um, so it should be based on your long-term goals, uh, the length of time you have to invest, also, you know, so your, or your life stage, you know, if you're, you know, if you're 50 or 55 and looking for retirement, then there's maybe a different strategy that's in place uh, for somebody closer to retirement than somebody that's in their, you know, early 20s. Um, your comfort level with risk is also very important uh, in how you uh, develop your strategy. Uh, and, and then there's certain steps that are required to get there. The, you know, there may be trade-offs that you'll need to take along the way. You know, sometimes you can't uh, spend more money than, than uh 
than you want to because you have to stick to the strategy and you know yeah so you have to make some choices along the way on what what's most important in terms of uh, achieving those goals. Uh, rule number two is understanding your risk. You know, risk and return generally go hand in hand. Higher, the higher return potential you want, the more risk you'll have to accept. Uh, there's many types of investment risks, such as uh, the market, economy, interest rate risk. But it goes beyond the pot potential for declines. Risks include your comfort, uh, your comfort level with risk, how much risk can you take on, and also how much risk you may need to take to reach your goals. Uh, understanding risk is how we uh, and how to address it uh, is key to uh, developing your long term strategy. Rule number three. Um, so diversification for a solid uh, foundation for your investment strategy. The, found, the foundation of your portfolio is your asset allocation, your diversified mix of stocks, bonds, cash, international and other investment or asset classes is you know, how we develop a, a diversified investment strategy. Diversification doesn't ensure a profit or protect against the loss, but it can help provide a smoother ride over time, reducing swings in value. So when a single investment or an asset class performs poorly, it's a disappointment and not a complete disaster. Rule number four, uh, this is really important. Um, you make sure we're sticking with uh, quality investments and strategies, you know, so you know, the second bullet point there on that slide, you know, fads versus fundamentals, uh, you know, there's been a lot of fads recently, if uh, you've paid attention, especially over the last couple of years with things like, you know, GameStop, for instance, if anybody remembers uh, what was going on with those types of things, but, you know, all, all the factors to consider when, when investing, we believe that quality is one of the most important. It's also one of the most overlooked. Um, Stocks have larger price fluctuations than bond investments. Quality, quality in stocks is frequently measured by the uh, steadiness of earnings and dividend growth over time. Uh, you know, and your total return is the combination of the dividends and capital gains. Uh, for bonds, one measure of quality is investment grade uh, credit rating, which indicates the borrower has a good track record of making its promised uh, interest payments and principal payments. Quality also means these investments have a financial, have the financial strength and track record over time that may help them overcome uh, temporary challenges. A very important uh, part of our investment philosophy at Edward Jones is definitely quality. Uh, and the second part of that is investing for the long term. Um, you know, it's you probably heard the saying before, but it's about time in the market, not timing the market, right? Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball. Uh, I do not. If you know anybody that does, I'd love to talk to them. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, so one of the biggest uh, mistakes investors make is trying to time the market, moving in and out because of short-term declines uh, or the latest prediction. Unfortunately, this often results in getting in, a, in and out of the market at the wrong times, costing not only time and money, but also potentially progress towards achieving your goals. Uh, we believe that the most consistently successful investment strategy is to own a well-diversified well portfolio of quality investments and a plan to own those investments for the long term. Um, so, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that we don't ever make changes. You're not going to buy something and hold on to it forever if, you know, for some reason, uh, you know, an investment, you know, particularly if, like an individual stock, if you own individual stocks and, and that company falls out of favor and, you know, maybe you don't want to own it forever, but, you know, the intention is not to buy something today and, you know, sell it tomorrow because it's moved a few percentage points. Uh, and then rule number six, you have to have realistic expectations. Uh, your expectations about how your investments will perform can have a big effect on your strategy. Your return expectations should be based on your asset allocation between stocks and bonds, the market environment, and your time frame. Uh, we believe that setting realistic goals and expectations can help you accurately track your progress and ultimately achieve your long-term goals. Um, you know, so something that we do when we're developing a, a strategy with with clients is really. Uh, focusing on what those average long-term returns are. That doesn't mean, you know, 
if the average return of a portfolio is expected to be 7%, that doesn't mean that in any one given year, uh, you can't have a 15%, 20% or greater return. Uh, you know, and the opposite also applies too. You may, you know, the average may be seven, but you could have a year where your portfolio ends up being down, you know, 10 or 15%. That's um, something you also have to be comfortable with that, you know, knowing that uh, investments do fluctuate in value from time to time, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's part of, uh, part of being an investor is uh, sometimes the markets go up and down. Um, which brings us to rule number seven, um, maintaining your balance. So, you know, over time, you know, right now is a pretty good uh, example of, uh, you know, assets and accounts getting out of alignment from their original uh, targeted balance. So because of fluctuations in the market, you know, in this case, you know, the stock markets uh, dropped down pretty significantly uh, for the first couple of months of this year. Um, when you may have started the year with a portfolio that was, you know, 80% stocks, 20% bonds, well, those stock investments have lost some value. So now maybe you're more, you know, 60, 40 in terms of the balance between the percentage of uh, stocks versus bonds. So now is the time where you, uh, you really need to look at rebalancing uh, your assets and, and making sure that we're, you know, staying on track with the, with the portfolio that we've developed. So rebalancing you know, it's the process of uh, reallocating your investments to reduce areas where they are overweight and add to areas where you're underweight. Uh, also key for this, uh, this particular time that we're in, rebalancing can run counter to your, your emotions. Uh, you may be selling assets that have performed well and adding to areas that have underperformed. Uh, you know, so that's it's the tough decision right now sometimes for people is to make, make adjustments when, when there's a lot of volatility, but um, it really is, you know, the best way to main, maintain uh, your portfolio uh, to reach your goals. Um, and then regularly rebalancing, you can ensure that your portfolio remains aligned with your objectives and your comfort level with risk. Uh, and it helps take the emotion out of investing decisions. Um, and, and it can help you stay on track to meet your long-term goals. So if you're committed, you know, in this case, you're know, taking the emotion out of it, if you're committed to the strategy and the portfolio that you set up, then you can, you know, confidently say, okay, I'm, I, we need to rebalance these assets. This is why this is our strategy. This is our plan. Uh, and this is why it makes sense. So hopefully that, that helps take some of that emotional anxiety out of the equation. Uh, rule number eight, we're going to dig into this a little bit uh, more in a little while, but uh, preparing for the unexpected, um, you know, you can't predict the future, but you can prepare for it. Um, so, you know, we'll, like I said, we'll dig into to more of that, but that's, you know, can be insurance needs, emergency savings, uh, and those types of things. Um, so I'm going to freeze by this one real quick. So we'll come back to that. Uh, rule number nine, really important uh, <laughs> in life in general, and uh, particularly investing is uh, focus on what you control. There, uh, you know, you can't control everything. There, you know, there's some things you can't control, the day-to-day -day fluctuations in the market, the economy, political environment. <laughs> uh, the good news is you don't really have to worry about those things that can, you can control. If your goals haven't changed and the events don't change our long-term outlook, there's probably isn't a reason to make any changes to your strategy. So really the key there is, you know, I mean, again, there's, you know, if you're looking at the news, there's a crisis somewhere every day um, that, that can have, you know, positive, negative effects on, on the markets. Um, and the daily fluctuations in the market uh, lately have been, uh, you know, somewhat extreme. You know, so really you, you can't control those things. So part of your strategy, you can't, you know, going back to trying to time the market or if you hear, you know, rumors about something and, you know, you can't control any of that stuff. What you can control is having a quality portfolio, a really solid plan. You know, maybe you have to tweak that plan based on something that's going on, but, you know, unless there's some major, you know, uh, change to what the outlook is, uh, sticking with the plan and controlling what you can control uh, and focusing on your strategy really is the, the best way to go about it. And then finally, rule number 10. Uh, re reviewing your strategy regularly, uh, you know, 
most of the time we do annual reviews uh, with clients or you know quarterly updates, but more of an you know an in-depth annual review. Um, you know, and that's really you know kind of going back to square one, looking at what our goals are. Uh, you know, if anything's changed with a, within your life, you know, if you've had a kid or you know somebody's you know lost a job unfortunately or something you know major events like that happen and you know we may need to make adjustments to the strategy oftentimes you know having those conversations with clients and just asking what's going on you know in your life is a way that we uncover some of these uh you know some of these new goals or or adjustments that uh you know might need to be made um you know so that's super important you know it's not you can't just set the set your retirement strategy up and then never revisit it because uh, things can change and knock you off course uh you know a positive change that could happen is you know somebody gets a new job that's paying them you know substantially more money uh, than they were making before that's an opportunity to adjust your strategy as well and, and and review what your goals are i mean if you know your goal maybe was to retire at 70 years old and you know you're 45 and now you've got a job that's paying you 20 percent more than you were making before well maybe that retirement date changes uh that's going to require maybe an adjustment in how much money you're saving um you know so not all the not all the changes to your strategy are for bad reasons but uh regularly reviewing it uh certainly a great idea um let's see and then, you know, so that brings us to preparing for the unexpected. Again, you know, a basic, you know, foundational thing for preparing for unexpected events is having you know, that emergency cash that you need, you know, set to the side, you know, if it's in some sort of investment vehicle that's in something that you can access, something that's not going to be subject to market, market fluctuations, you might be able to generate a little bit of interest on it, something like a CD, for example. Um, but the general rule uh, is three to six months of expenses. So that's where you can go back to that budget that you've created and looking at those necessary expenses that you have and making sure, you know, three to six months is there in the event that, you know, something happens, there's an illness, somebody loses a job, uh, disability, something like that. I mean, you never know what, what could happen. And, and, you know, this is really, you know, in place to, you know, to make sure that if something does happen that it's not going to derail your entire strategy for planning for retirement. So, if, you know, if somebody loses a job for a few months, you've got that money set aside. Maybe you can't contribute as much towards your retirement at that time, but you're not, you know, forced to sell assets, for example. Because um, in that case, if you're, if you need money and you have to sell assets, you know, Murphy's Law would, would have it that the market will be down when you need to access that money and that would never be a good time to sell. <laughs> um survivor needs so specifically talking about you know if something happens you know uh you know typical family uh, you know maybe and so this is something that a lot of people might overlook in in terms of thinking about insurance and survivor needs but let's say you know one spouse doesn't work and they provide for like the daycare for the children you might overlook that person in the equation of uh, of insurance because you go, well, they don't have any income that needs to be replaced. You know, you'd only be worried about the the, the spouse that that is working and providing the income for the family. But if that person that's the caretaker for the children, something happens to them. Well, then there's an expense associated with that uh, in terms of childcare needs. You know, if if the if the if the working spouse still needs to go to work, then you might have to start paying for daycare again. So that's an expense that you may not uh, think about. But so the, there's a couple ways you can go about uh, determining what those those levels of coverage are that you might need. You know, uh, term insurance typically for for most people is uh, the least expensive and most appropriate way to to provide for insurance needs. You know, typically with uh, you know, younger families, for instance, you know, if you've got younger children, uh, earlier on in life, you've got mortgages, things like that. Um, uh, you know, term insurance kind of fits, fits that need nicely uh, and less expensive than permanent insurance. But, 
So the, you know, a basic calculation is seven times, seven to 10 times your salary. Um, so if you're looking just to replace income, seven to 10 times your salary, um, and that's okay. I mean, if you make $100,000 a year, is a million dollars in insurance gonna be what you really need? You know, if you've got a mortgage, that's, you know, half a million dollars, uh, you know, and some of these other big expenses. So uh, another way to, to calculate this is, the LIFE acronym that you see there, and that stands for liabilities, income, final expenses, and education needs. Um, so that really is taking a, you know, I think a more appropriate look at, you know, what your coverage level should be. You know, you know, some people, if they pass away, they don't necessarily want to pay off the house. Or, you know, they'll just, the spouse may have to, can, you know, move or something like that. I mean, it's, you know, a personal decision. But if you're looking to replace income, pay off liabilities, you know, pay for those final expenses. You know, if you've got children, you want to send them, make sure that they can get the education they need or you want them to have. Um, so really looking at what, what those costs are that are, um, you know, associated with it and how best to replace them uh, if something happens to you. Uh, and then next you've got long-term care expenses. This is something that, you know, pretty much everybody is going to need some sort of long-term care uh, or, you know, care in general as you're older, you know, that could be in the home or, you know, on the, you know, the, the really bad side of things. If you end up, you know, in some, in a, uh, you know, a specialized care, long-term care facility, you know, the expenses can vary greatly. You know, the average long-term care cost now is somewhere around $8,000 a month. Uh, that's expensive. It's not going to get any cheaper. Uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, the reality of it, um, you know, I, I, I know I, from personal experience of seeing the cost associated with like specialized nursing care, you know, you can be getting closer to $20,000 a month there. So, you know, something like that. And again, and this is how we're preparing for unexpected things that, you know, if, if this happens to you, this, you know, especially long-term care, this can really derail, you know, your, your, your financial plan and your strategy, you know, so having a uh, something in place to to maybe at least cover some of the expenses, uh, you know, should something like that happen to you. And then there's, you know, a lot of people would look at a long term care policy, uh, you know, completely different than you would look at an auto insurance policy. It's like you never buy insurance with the intent to use it, um, and a lot of people are just feel like it may be an unnecessary cost, like a waste of money if you don't use it. So there's some other um, insurance policies are called hybrid policies where there's a, uh, a permanent insurance payout, you know, uh, aspect of it. So you can, you know, if you never use the long-term care rider, you know, there's still a death benefit uh, when you pass on, uh, you know, and then there, you know, if you do access, if you do need long-term care, you can access those benefits, uh, you know, while you're still living. Uh, another one is a, a legacy goal. So again, if, you know, if you're a person that, you know, you have a little bit more money, you want to leave some money behind, maybe your children, a charity, whatever the case may be, uh, and you want to make sure that that money, you know, gets to who you want it to go to, uh, insurance can be a, a, a good tool to, to make that happen. You know, in the event that something really tragic or unexpected happens, uh, you know, it could be any number of things, but let's say, you know, you, you've saved up a million dollars and you're retired and then something terrible happens and you maybe don't have long-term care uh, insurance or a way to pay for some of these other costs. And you erode a lot of that money you've saved up that you were really just intending to, you know, maybe live off a little bit and then leave the rest behind to your children. You know, insurance, a permanent insurance policy would be a, could be a good way to, uh, designate, you know, an exact dollar amount you want to leave behind, like I said, to a charity or, or spouse or, you know, whatever other beneficiaries you, you might want um, to, to leave money to. And then, you know, kind of coming full circle back to a lot of the stuff that Sierra spoke about, you know, planning your states are part of the, the process that we go through is making sure that, you know, we're reviewing beneficiaries and that we've got contingent beneficiaries on, a, on your accounts, you know, to make sure that, you know, if, you know, if it's a husband and wife, if something happens to both of them and they've got kids, how do they want that money split up? Is it equally between, you know, all three or does, for whatever reason, one child get more than the other? But, 
um, you know, really making sure that we've, you've got, you know, your investments and accounts titled uh, the way that they need to be. So what you intend to happen indeed does happen. And you've got, you know, trust accounts and things like that, that they're, you know, all of these, all of the elements of that are aligned with your, your goals and, you know, having estate planning goals doesn't necessarily need you, you know, mean you need millions and millions of dollars. It's about, you know, making sure that what you want to happen happens when you're not around uh, and that your, you know, your plans are in place and, and things happen the way you want them. So that was kind of quick. I feel like I jammed a lot of information in there, but um, I guess now we, we can, we can open up to questions for everybody else. Try and stop sharing my screen here. All right. I think I stopped sharing it. You did. You got All right. <laughs> would so you like if, people to just unmute themselves and ask a question or would you rather them put it in the chat? I think unmuting them would be fine if they're, okay. comfortable, yeah, that's fine. That, if they're comfortable talking. If anyone has a question, and it can be for myself or Nate about anything we spoke about, or if it was something that perhaps we didn't cover, um, and if you know we can address it, we'd be happy to. Anyone have a question? Guess not. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Um, actually, it's for Nate. So just, I think like Nate probably learned some stuff from my um, speech. Nate, one thing I was wondering is, is there like a typical monthly investment amount that you guys suggest? Is, I mean, how do you base it? Is it based upon what our disposable income is? Or is it based upon what our, our regular income is to, to put into investments monthly? You know, so... It's different for everybody, for individuals. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was just the, the typical formula, right? Like, so something that I, whenever I'm talking to, you know, particularly younger people, but let's say, you know, if you're 25 and, you know, you want to retire at 65 and you put 500 bucks a month away for, for that time period from 25 to 65, you know, incredibly likely that, you know, by the time you're 65, you probably have one, 1 1.2 million somewhere around there in your investment account with, um, I don't remember the exact math, but that's with the total contributions over that same time period or somewhere around, you know, $270,000. Um, so that's the real big benefit of having time on your side uh, and systematically investing in compounding growth. Uh, but, you know, it really is a specific, you know, I guess the general answer is as much as you can. Uh, you know, put away as much as you can. There's a bunch, you know, you can find different formulas on, uh, you know, how you know, like you should put 25% away, uh, you know, depending on your situation. I mean, it'd be great if everybody could do that, but you know, if you're, you know, making $35,000 a year, maybe you, you know, you can't. <laughs> um, but so in that's, in that case, I would say something, you know, and, you know, generally if, uh, Looks like there's a question for you there, Sierra, in the chat. So is a spouse responsible for their spouse's debt debts upon death? For example, if they have a credit card in only their name, so in only one spouse's name, does the surviving spouse have to pay it? No, it is that person's debt if it's in only their name. If they die, the credit card company would have to file a claim on that person's estate, whether or not the estate's even been opened. It's possible there is no estate that actually is open at all. Um, they can still file a claim, wait six months, and if no estate's ever opened, if they think there is money there, I'm not going to get too complicated in this, but the short answer is uh, no. If my husband has a credit card in his name, he goes to tractor supply and opens a credit card and spends five thousand dollars i've never had anything to do with it then no i do not have to pay off that credit card when he dies his estate could have to pay it if his estate has funds in it it's different than me being responsible the estate the pr might be the spouse so they might write the check if the estate has funds but it is not the spouse the spouse is a separate person their social security number is not tied to that credit card. No, they do not have to pay it. 
if there's a lien, there's, it, so, it sounds like maybe there's two different questions really. And then it says, I'm assuming, yes, if they own a house together, if they own a house together, it's a totally separate thing than if one spouse dies with that, with that sole debt. Um, did a lien attach to the house? It would have to, I'd have to have more questions um, to find out what the final answer is though. If there is a lien on the house based upon a debt of the spouses and they let that lien attach, then yeah, at some point it'll get paid, but it is not the spouse's responsibility if they did not incur the debt under their social security number, okay? And that's a really common question. So I should have thought about that. Nate, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. um, what if somebody is starting over saving for retirement in their later years? Are, are there any kind of catch up things they can do? Like I know you can contribute to a Roth for a certain amount of money, but are there larger amounts they could put away in a retirement account? Yeah, so once you're, uh, geez, what's the age? 50, over 50, uh, you can, there's catch up contributions that can be made. So it varies depending on whether it's a, you know, if it's an employer plan, uh, the maximum, you know, so that you could put in a 401k, for example, is $19,500 the catch up is an additional five per year. Uh, if it's just a regular traditional IRA or a Roth IRA that's not attached to your employer, uh, it goes from 6,000 to $7,000 that you can put away. You know, so there's those options for retirement. Um, and this is something I, I kind of meant to touch on when we're talking about diversification uh, too, but uh, there's also a ways, you know, and good strategy to diversify your investment account type. So having tax deferred like a 401k or an IRA, tax free investing like a Roth IRA, uh, and then taxable investments. You know, if you have investments that are in a taxable account, uh, you know, it's a good way. One, you know, you've got the opportunity. Inevitably, there'll be some losses that you can use to offset some gains. And there's, you know, so it just gives you different strategies. But yes, there are there are more options. Or you can put away more money when you're a little older to to catch up. Yes. Thank you. That was a long winded answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. You're saying it's not too late. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, to be quite honest, it sounds like it, at age 25, five hundred dollars a month is a lot of money for a 25 year old, depending on what their income is. Um, so I'm sure you hear that a lot, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. And most 25 year olds are spending all their money. You know, so. <laughs> That's true. It is hard to say. Well, you haven't acquired much yet. So you might have to buy things that, you know, a 38 year old that already has a couch. They already have furniture. Right. They right. don't have to buy all these things to create a home. So at 25, it's hard. You know, I, I understand what that spending is happening. But do you, um, is there a certain period or a certain number that people will reach that you say, well, I don't think you need to keep monthly investing anymore. And instead it becomes a, we reinvest like dividends for gains. So generally like the reinvesting of dividends is, is unless a client says they don't want to do it for a specific reason, that's usually how we do everything. So even if you're younger and you've got a thousand dollars in account, every dime of dividend money that comes back in is buying more shares of that investment. That's really how you see the, the compounding, uh, you know, really increase there. So I do have like, you know, it could be, and it's not necessarily the, the amount of money that a client might have accumulated. It's more about their life stage, you know? So when we shift from, you know, building up, you know, and saving for retirement to, you know, shifting the focus to, okay, now I'm retired. I need a stream of income. You know, if you have a lot of dividend paying investments, and maybe at that point, you know, that's where we go, okay, I know that this, you know, XYZ stock pays me 4% dividend, you know, that's going to provide me with $500 a month in, in income. Maybe we don't reinvest that anymore. Maybe that money just systematically goes out to the bank or a check shows up in the mailbox once a month or whatever it is. But so less about, you know, the dollar amount and more about the, you know, the time frame and where, where they're at and they're, you know, along their journey. Um, some some people will take those dividends. I have a few clients that we are in dividend paying stocks and they'll wait, you know, they, they don't reinvest them. They'll wait till it adds up to, you know, a few thousand dollars in cash in their account. And then we'll go find another, you know, that's how we kind of build out the portfolio and, you know, find another investment to purchase at that time. So there's lots of different strategies. I mean, it, it's, it really isn't 
one size fits all. I mean, there's, you know, so many different ways you can go about, you know, helping, you know, develop that strategy and really, you know, specific to each, each person's individual needs. And if you have multiple goals too, it's, you know, something might be just, you know, somebody's got, you know, their retirement money that they're more conservative with and maybe some money that, you know, they got a bonus or something and they go, okay, I got this little chunk of money. I want to be way more aggressive with this money. And that's a, just a completely different strategy than, you know, what you're doing with, you know, you know, people call it the real money. <laughs> Not the play money. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? I'll save Nate for, you know, personally, I'll ask him all my questions on the side so I don't waste everyone else's time. So, um, so I just wanted to, if no one else has any more questions, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that as far as part of um, the Calvert County Commission for Women, um, this is an event that we wanted to host, but it's probably, we're going to try to make it a series of events so that we, um, I, between Brenda Street and myself and anyone else from the commission that wants to be involved, where we might do this biannually. So um, what I wanted to say is if you enjoyed this today, we might also have, or we're planning to have in the fall, another event through Calvert Library um, on another um, financial literacy type of um, type uh, topic. Um, one thing we considered is discussing reverse mortgages. Um, and we might also bring in to, to discuss other, you know, other types of uh, planning that might take place. So if you have any suggestions, you want to hear from any expert, please let us know um, if you have some topic that is of interest to you, because we're hoping to do this as a series uh, moving forward. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. I don't know if you have any remarks, Brenda, to, to, to close us out. I do. I actually want to say on the behalf of the Calvert County Commission for Women, we would like to thank the library for collaborating with us and everyone else that has joined us on this event. Thank you for sharing your time with us. And we would like to say thank you and have an excellent day. Thanks. Awesome. Yes, thank you all for coming. And I will post, this is Jen from the library. Um, I will post this on YouTube and everybody who's come, I should have your email from you registering. So I will um, send you the link. And we also have a program coming up, Social Security Retirement. It's uh, this Tuesday. Um, and we've got a specialist who comes from the Social Security Administration and she's fantastic. So um, you might wanna check that out. It's uh, this Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That actually sounds like- Thank a you. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Thank you, Nate. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to come back to any of the other ones, too.